In a vast wasteland of entertainment where radio has become obsolete, stands an embittered man teetering at the edge of sanity. With help from radio friends, he's about to embark on a global mission that would change the course of history as we know it. Broadcasting live from the secret studios on the banks of the Brandywine River in Delaware is Mitchell K.C. Hill. And up to the Great White North in Vancouver is Alexander Knight. Don't worry, that was me screaming. Because I'm introducing myself and I figure everything's fair game. Welcome to episode number three. Uh, we've done three of these and we have not been shut down yet. So that's an encouraging sign right there. And uh, we want to thank all the people that uh, follow us. Uh, you know how it is. Smash the subscribe. Hit the like. Uh, if you don't do any of those things, we won't be back. It's like a telethon. Please give. If you don't, we won't be able to continue our broadcast. My name is Mitchell Hill. I'm uh, My nickname was KC Hill when I was on the radio. But I also had other radio names that existed. Uh, those just happened to be two of the ones I used. Why do we have radio names? I have no idea. Perhaps it's easier to remember a person whose name, like if you're, you know, Stefan Shablonsky style, uh, that would be a hard thing to uh, to remember every time. A guy with an easy name to remember is Alexander Knight. Just think of Knight Rider, and you're in the case. Alexander, take a bow. Hello, everyone. Good to be back. I am so excited to be here for episode three. We had a great first two episodes, Steve Stryker, episode one. Had a fantastic conversation about the the current state of the broadcast industry, and we talked about ageism a little bit, which is a, a very uh, important topic of mine. You know, I've experienced that a lot in the workplace. I'm sure we'll, that that topic will pop up again. We had Paul Wallace in episode two. That was a great conversation about artificial intelligence and uh, how we're all going to be losing our jobs uh, on Monday tomorrow. No, I'm just kidding. Tomorrow, you said tomorrow, mate. A. That's all right. And, and the great thing is that Alexander is my good friend from uh, in the Great White North. He is Canadian, if you haven't figured it out. He's also the younger guy. I love that he said ageism like me. He's like, what? You're like 30-something uh, age-wise. I'm and I'm, all right, don't tell everybody how old you are. You're not supposed to do <laughs> that. But anyhow. <laughs> Sorry. Is it talking out loud. You're again. switching something. I can see my, my image is going. Eh, 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 eh. So, uh yeah, yeah, you're like you're like you got you're struggling with age. I'm 69 years old. I'm pushing 70, so that's also why I'm the last angry DJ. I'm the last angry DJ. Now, <laughs> Alexander is another last angry DJ. So you might be the runner up to being the last angry DJ, but you got a few years to go before you get there. But anyhow, one of the things I've been complaining about is my head is too big in the image, so I've got to oh, I got to well, move yeah. back. Is that better? Yeah. Have, have people I'm, told you know, and I start looming over the screen, people start getting <laughs> ah, after watching in a living room on a, like a big screen. And if you look at these uh, YouTube things, and they, they made like totally normal here, but when you put it on a 55 or an 85 inch screen, scary, and you got this giant scary, head, very scary, giant head. It's like in that Superman episode where you shall go to the Phantom Zone. You know, it's it's very much like that. So anyhow. I'm trying. I really, truly am trying. And we do listen to you guys. I'm looking over to see. Let's see. Hi, Laura. Hi, Stephen. Hey, John. Good to have you all here. Um, we do this show every week, and we do it live uh, to tape. So you can watch either the, the the goodness of liveness, or you can watch it later after it's been uh, pushed out to all the podcasts, and it's an audio-only thing. But one of the cool things that's being done by Alexander, by the way, he does all the hard work. I just get to be me, and that's the hard work. But Alexander's doing all the hard work. Um, he created the YouTube Shorts, which is kind of a, a short, uh, it's sort of like uh, uh, the show for dummies because it's all chopped down into little pieces that are interesting. And uh, why don't you explain what a YouTube Short is because I think people are, are curious about yeah, what that so is. Yeah, so a YouTube Short is basically a 60-second vertical video. So, we, you know, we're used to most watching most things. When you watch a movie, TikTok. it's in landscape, wide, 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 
wide and get my hands within the frame there. Wide aspect ratio. Um, so yeah, we're doing YouTube shorts, which are 60 seconds. And we're also doing content for Instagram and TikTok, which have much, uh, you can actually do a longer video there. So I'm trying to keep it to about 90 seconds on both Instagram and TikTok. So we, we already have about, I think, six or seven pieces up there from episode one. Episode two uh, is going to be, we're going to be rolling out the uh, the clips for that in the next 24 hours or so. Uh, there's always a bit of a delay after we, we air the episode, just working on that because it's a lot of work to get that stuff done. But uh, I, I'm hoping that that will allow us to bring in some, some new listeners uh, who may not know about our podcast because it's still pretty new. Yeah, it's like an extended family. And that's the way I'd like to see this program evolve because you have the lot to say. Yes, you, you people out there in your seated, in your uh, TV rooms, whatever, our computers. Do you consume mo- uh, media via a laptop or a desktop or do you do, put it down to your big TV set in your living room? That's the question. I don't know. What, however you do it. That's why I'm trying to keep back yeah. on the screen so I don't uh, loom over people. That's the last thing I it's, want to it's, do. It's interesting because I, I watch a lot of people's uh, – I watch their behavior, and it's really interesting because now with cell phones, we spend so much of our time looking at these tiny, tiny screens, which in a way it actually kind of – it frustrates me because, you know, we, we put – you and I, Mitch, you know – people like us that do these kind of productions, we put so much time and effort into getting the audio right, getting the video to look right, all this production work into the video especially, and you know, and then people are just watching this stuff on a tiny, tiny phone and not always under the best conditions. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I see people at work, too, not use headphones. I'm not sure why. There seems to be a growing number of people that don't even use headphones. And, again, it's like... I do all this work to make this audio sounds good, and you're listening to the audio playback on some tinny built-in speaker on your mobile phone. I'm not sure why people do that. Have you ever seen somebody on the on the train or just out in public, just open speaker, just listening to stuff? It's very strange. I don't understand it. I don't take the public transportation for obvious reasons. <laughs> I'm like the Larry David of the world. You're not, have, you're not I, missing it. There's, there's really not much out there. It's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you right I, now. I comment about everything I see around me, and I get into trouble, you know, and the, trying to be helpful. But if I'm on a train, I'm into a fight. Eventually, I'm the guy in the back, and everybody's against me, <laughs> meaning that they're all looking at me and watching, and they're pushing me slowly and slowly to the back, right back to, to the. Can you say caboose now? Because I know that's sure one not. of the words that have been say whatever you want. From don't the, let me stop you. Okay, I don't mean anything by it other than the caboose used to be the back end of the train. Okay. Right. Yeah. So people no, settle down. It's fine. Um, one of the things I want to uh, let you all know, um, we're, we're a new podcast. We've got more and more subscribers and followers. Thank you very much. Smash the buttons. Hit the buttons, for God's sakes. Um, and if you're doing that, uh, you get more and more people. And the more and more people we have, the better guests we can get on. So it's not just me and Alex speaking, but um, I just booked uh, Craig Shoemaker who you may know as a Hollywood-level uh, comedian. He's coming on April 7th. That's two weeks from tonight, today, wherever you happen to be. Um, he'll be on the program. Look forward to having him here. And um, that's just the beginning. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, cancel culture, how hard it is to be relevant and funny and entertaining without hurting people's feelings. The problem with comedy is it's not always pretty. It's hard to be funny without somehow somebody's picking up the check. Somebody's getting picked on here. And uh, that's the world we live in. It's hard to be funny about something unless you're being funny about yourself. Right. Um, and even that upsets people. People get upset when you pick on yourself. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I think that's that's fair game because if you're going to try to be relevant and funny today, somebody is going to call it out as being um, uh, hurting their feelings. Yeah, absolutely. Or, as and, and I don't know, Alex, if you can properly identify what cancel culture or woke means, but just for the sake of getting it on record, here's what I think it is, and then you tell me what it is. I think as an older guy that uh, woke means that you can get upset on behalf of somebody else. So if somebody says something that's insulting, not to the person that's commenting, but to the person that somebody else may know— if I said somebody is large and in charge, which used to be a term we used on the radio, then uh, a woke person would say, no, can't say that. You're picking on somebody and now it's body shaming. So it's uh, it's very, very hard to be funny and entertaining 
the screen just went dark there for a second. I don't know what happened. Uh, funny and entertaining without somebody raising their hand and saying, you can't do that. You can't say that. So um, uh, Craig, he was very good at that. He's also uh, a great humanitarian and a philanthropist. Philanthropist? Philanderer? No, that can't be <laughs> that, it. That's, that is he's so a, right. I guess he's not coming now, but he was going to be coming before I went and said that. I, I mean that so he's a just... great guy, that he <laughs> tries to help other people, and occasionally flanders, or at least he did you back when I had to ruin it, Mitch. You had to ruin it. That's the way it works with we me. I told you. We were almost there. We were almost there. That's that's the way it works with me. I just go, and then I just completely make just it completely say things, discombobulated. Just come out of your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to control. It's like flying monkeys. Just they're flying. Yeah. Fly, fly away. Oh, the humanity. So um, Craig will be here. We have other guests. Uh, we're getting more broadcast people lined up. This is a tough time with a small group that we are uh, to get guests because. They're, it's not that they don't want to come on and help out, but when you have like 50 followers, not millions of followers, it's hard to get people engaged. They like say, well, I could go on Joe Rogan or I can go on Mr. Beast and get a lot more attention for my time. You know, help the small guy out. If you want to be truly woke, help the small guy out. We're the small guys. Yeah. We're the new kids on the block. I just want to... So, uh, I just want to take a moment, yeah. Mitch, uh, just to update a few people here. So I just wanted to uh, let everyone know, if you want to follow us on Instagram and TikTok, it's at the last angry DJ on all platforms. We have a Twitter account as well, and uh, we're, we're in progress currently on getting a Q&A system in place uh, so that people can uh, ask us some questions as well, especially I think that'll be super valuable uh, once we have uh, some some guests on the show as well, and they may want to just ask someone like Craig. Uh, I don't know if we'll, we'll have it in time there for Craig's uh, Craig's episode, but we'll do the best we can. I'm hoping to get that implemented uh, soon as well. And, uh, yeah, so that's another way you can support the show is check out some of the shorts that we're doing on YouTube and Instagram, TikTok, and all those platforms as well. Uh, for now, you can actually email us. If you have any feedback or questions, you can send it to hello at the last angry DJ. Dot com. I know email, and nobody uses email anymore. Yeah, a lot of people still use email, so feel free to shoot us an email as well. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to also uh, talk a little bit about what's going on in the world of broadcast right now. So there's a little bit of news this week uh, that I thought was um, I thought was rather uh, interesting here, and uh, I just want to talk about this article I came across here. Oh, that doesn't work. Broadcast numbers. I'm so sorry. I, I just realized I can't put my lower third <laughs> yeah, it doesn't uh, thing work on up a there. Super source. I was just, see, I was trying to top you, and I can't because now it's being that's truncated okay. that's, that's right. or clipped. Okay, uh, go ahead. So, Sorry. So I came across this article here uh, about numerous winter PPM ratings for Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, and Montreal and Toronto. Explain so what PPM P is. PPM, peak, uh, well, I'm an audio guy, peak program it's meter. A personal, no, it's, not, it's not that. It's a personal uh, watermarked audio that goes out there you and... Go. People wear these little gadgets on their belt, and it uh, indicates what station you're listening to. That's yeah. a PPM meter. Okay, there we go. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about on episode one, when we started talking with with Steve Stryker about the broadcast industry, current state of that, like, where's where's the money? The money's not there anymore. Ad spends are not what they were. A lot of, uh, because of the diff diversification of media now, and you got podcasts and YouTube and a lot of ad dollars going into YouTube, especially that platform, and podcasts and all that sort of stuff. So we've seen a lot of that be diverted away from radio. We've seen the um, uh, amalgamation of various uh, radio stations. Well, a lot of radio stations have been purchased by by big media companies, and a lot of them are owned by big media companies. I mean, not just here in Canada, but I know down in the U.S. as well. I mean, you guys have uh, a handful of big companies Five looks like Mitch is saying five here uh, that that own a lot of radio stations. I mean, it's it's hard to survive these days as an independent radio station, right? And in Canada here, Bell Media, which is a massive telecom company, has become a company that not only provides telephones, telephone services, mobile phone services. But they are a truly a media company that owns all these radio stations. And this week there was an article here that uh, Bell Media has announced the sale of 45 of its radio stations, uh, declaring, quote unquote, it's not a viable business anymore. 
which is which is really interesting. So you have big companies that are, you know, these guys have deep pockets, but even they are seeing, you know, massive, massive decline in 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 ads in in revenue from advertising and in also from from listeners. We talked about that on episode one and two about uh, people are just not listening to the radio anymore. They're not getting their music from radio anymore. And they're certainly not really going to radio for for breaking news anymore. I mean, that's that's something that people. Well, you just know, are not you know, doing. something is wrong with the business when the top companies like iHeartMedia, mm-hmm. which used to be Clear Channel, um, some of the other uh, corporations. I think Odyssey. I think that's how you say their name. It used to be Intercom. They have all the CBS stations. Anyhow, uh, most of them are in some form of uh, uh, bankruptcy. Uh, or Chapter 11 or Chapter 9 or all those chapters are. I don't know. It's like a DVD to me. I don't know. But anyhow, they're not surviving as well as they used to, and they're trying to pay back these huge loans that they have out to the banks, and they're too big to fail. Just I'm just adding a paraphrase to what you were saying about the, uh, the industry. The reason that mm-hmm. that's all happening is something we should explore. Why are all these major corporations that own most of the radio stations on the North American continent – um, why are they failing? Well, it's a really good question. I mean, uh, again, it, it's a nuanced problem. It's complicated. Uh, it, I, I mean, really, if you go back, and I haven't actually looked at the data, but it'd be very interesting if somebody were to compile all this data together and look back at when podcasts first started, you know, 15 plus years ago now, probably a little bit longer, and where they are now. And if someone, I would love to see a chart where it shows the the, the drop off as podcasts are rising up, uh, radio uh, terrestrial radio interest is just considerably dropping. I mean, I'm 41, so I used to listen to the radio a lot. I mean, back in the 90s when I was growing up in in high school, uh, C Fox was an incredible radio station. I mean, some of my favorite radio personalities were just so they were so interesting and I, I loved listening to them on the radio and they were funny and entertaining and I would find out about new bands and I loved listening to inter- you know either we have uh, musicians on the shows and I would get to learn a little bit more about their lives uh, you know before the internet was you know we didn't even have broadband really in the 90s that was towards the tail end I was on dial up back then so a lot has changed and I just don't really care about terrestrial radio all that much. I still, you know, I actually have to, people don't know this, I actually have to commute to a job uh, every day. And so I do listen, I find myself listening to AM radio sometimes for traffic stuff, but I could really live without it. I mean, Apple Maps, Google Maps, Waze, all these If you're commuting, why are you concerned with the uh, traffic? Well, because I have to deal with a lot of traffic problems on a day-to-day basis, so the route okay. that, I'm, that that I'm on um, has a uh, lot of all problems. All right, let me let me jump in here. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I am interrupting. You know when people say, "I'm sorry, I need to interrupt." No, or, I'm sorry, okay. I'm interrupting. You're not sorry. You're interrupting. Go, go ahead. You're just, just flat me. out interrupting. You're okay, getting in the way ahead. of his stream of stream of thought. I just want to jump in and say, a podcast did not kill the radio star. It might contributed to it, but the thing that's killed the radio star and all the opinions expressed are, are, are 100% my own. And, oh, I get to put my thing up here a second. There it is. Now I can well, who's put other, my name Whose opinion would it be if it wasn't? Um, it would be the opinion of most uh, seasoned broadcasters. I see. You know, people in the know, you know, they know what's going on. Uh, what's happened is that it used to be that for your entertainment on audio, it was uh, you had maybe three or four radio stations in the market, and that's what you listened to. Um, the alternative was there was no internet. There were maybe three or four TV stations. So if you wanted to be exposed to music, you had the radio stations out there. What's happened since those golden days of radio, which probably started happening, the switch started happening in the 90s when the internet sort of caught on, is that you have more choices. And most of those choices are designed to give you exactly what you want when you want it. So it's gone from being broadcasting, which is a approximation of all of the things that everybody as a common denominator want to hear, like top 40 was a common denominator to people that want to hear classic rock or country or punk or talk radio or whatever the format is. It's got very segmented to what we would call narrow casting. And because uh, the radios mean that pies being sliced so thin nowadays, 
is that it's hard for any one station to dominate because you have many, 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 many more choices to pick what you want to hear. The other thing that's contributing to the demise of radio as we know it, and we're in that stage right now, it's not too late, but it's darn close, is that people, uh, all these big corporations that came along and bought up all your radio stations in your market are being run out of a corporate headquarters in San Antonio, Texas, or L.A., or Chicago, or New York. And they tend to want to homogenize and uh, 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 make everything that you see and hear on that radio station sound the same from coast to coast. It's cheaper for them if they find a format and a pres- right. presenter or DJ that works across the board for, all, for, for one station. They can save the money by simulcasting that across all of their stations or playing the same music. So there isn't diversity in terms of presentation. If they find something that works, they do it and replicate it across the board. And that might be 80% of the radio stations in your market, because now a large station or a large company can own four or five radio stations in one market. So where's the diversity coming from? There are no more ma pa stations that are breakaway winners because they found some kind of niche market that right. contributes or speaks to people individually. So radio continues to be its own worst enemy in many, many cases. Of course, there's exceptions to all the rules, but it's working against itself in order to be uh, uh, be heard by more and more people. So there is a downward spike that's happening. But still, just mm. so we get the statistics correct, still radio is a very viable means of communicating and getting the word out there because it's simple, it's easy, it's uh, you don't have to worry about your internet connectivity. Um, you just push a button or turn something on, and you have your favorite. Well, I'm going back to push buttons, but yeah. that's the way we used to listen well, to stations. So I just want to bring that up. That that's, that's one important. thing that contributes to the to the uh, the the, uh, the fracturization. Can I, is it a word? Fractionization. You just made a new broadcasting word. Congratulations. As we know it. Uh, yeah, What's that? I said you just made up a you just made up a new word. Congratulations. Uh, here, let me ask you this, Mitch. Why do you think? Because I'm reading it, in, in actually, there's another article here, but there are a lot of organizations that are talking about how for broadcast terrestrial radio, they haven't really returned to pre-pandemic, meaning 2019 and beyond and before. Uh, they haven't returned to pre-pandemic revenue numbers. So why do you think in the last, actually, we're coming up on four years now, why do you think they haven't returned? Why do you think they haven't bounced back? Because there, more and more radio stations are shuttering. Uh, we're seeing increased layoffs across, I mean, both, both Canada and the United States. People are getting laid off all the time broadcast. Uh, actually, Patterson Media, which is a massive, massive company, just announced a lot of layoffs. So it's happening, and they are making changes. Like... For example, I'm not sure why they would do this, but I guess it's just for reach-wise. But a show that is broadcast in one city, like Edmonton, fairly successful show, now that's getting broadcast in Vancouver. So I'm not sure how well that would work for a hyper-local show. If you're talking, uh, if you're talking about stuff that's happening in your town, why would anyone in another city in another province or on the other side of the country care about that? So... You know, I guess they're trying to make more money, but my question is, why do you think things haven't bounced back to pre-pandemic numbers? Well, it, it's probably meant for somebody way smarter than myself to pontificate on this, but I'll give you my opinion. Um, a lot of businesses have been affected, not just radio, um, since the pandemic uh, went around. And uh, I can tell you that I, I have a side hustle for my work, and I do video production, commercials, uh, voiceover Uh, I do media-related production, and it has disappeared since the pandemic. And the answer I get from my main uh, typical corporate customers has been, well, we're just being very careful how we spend our money post-pandemic because we all got hurt during that time. So we're not going to step out and do as many projects as we used to. So they're being very conservative on how they spend money. So they're holding on to their dollars. And also with the unclear future politically, uh, and we will not get into that because I, I'm an obligatory guest to talk politics. I don't like to talk it. Is uh, they're a little concerned that the, how that may also affect. And are we are are we not headed for a recession? Mm-hmm. Some say yes. Some say no. Um, it's very complicated. But people just the fear or the potential that where's the other shoe going to drop uh, causes people to hold on to their money. 
And that affects everything, not just uh, in the broadcast business, but people buying homes, spending money, sure. going out buying a new yeah. car. Uh, people are going to be a lot more careful about that. So we're kind of in that stage where people are being very conservative right. and how they do it. So that, that will affect ad rev- well, revenues, yeah, and I, I again, see that, my opinion. I, we see that everywhere. I, and I certainly see that here, too, because— uh, you know, people are still, even here in Canada, too, people are, uh, just individuals and companies, too, are still being very cautious about not overstaffing, not, I think some people may have gone too far in one direction uh, where they overhired and then they suddenly realize, oh, wait, we don't actually, we have an overabundance and we need to get rid of some people. So there's that. And then, of course, inflation is not really helping every, anything. We've got the cost of food skyrocketing. And... I know food banks are at an all-time high in terms of utilization right now. So there are people that just can't afford, or barely can afford to put food on the table. And that's that's a serious, serious problem. So I think we're all still in that kind of mindset. You know, and I look a little – I don't study economics, but uh, people that talk about economics and know a lot more about this than me are starting to see things bounce back a little bit. But I, I think you're right, Mitch. I think that a lot of people are still being – cautious maybe you could argue too cautious a little bit uh about uh about the un- economic uncertainty that may be may be looming so it's really fascinating to see to how people perceive economic uncertainty and also how they how they feel about well what's going to happen the next year or so right yeah and, and to tighten it up a little bit um other than you know i think everybody's pretty well aware of what's happening out there in the world of uh finances and uh, business is you're not going to step out and try new formats or try, you know, edgy new programming because it's, you're taking a risk. And if you're in a corporate structure where you're making a decision to try something new, um, I, I, it's the what ass theory I call, sorry about my language. Uh, and that is if it doesn't work out, somebody's going to pay and somebody's going to have to take the fall for it. Um, who wants to be the person to say, yeah, I got this idea I'd like to try. There's no innovation going on. So it becomes very, uh, uh, very self-replicating, and it's like an airplane that's starting to stall. And now we're going into a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a dive, or maybe worse yet, a, a flat spin or something. I'm not an aeronautics expert, but I'm sure my airplane friends out there are saying, "Yeah, flat spin. That's tough to get out of. You got to know what you're doing to get out of uh, any, you know, problems like that." And I don't think we figured it out. So I think what you've done, if you pointed out, Alex, that we're in a tough time. Uh, for a uh, industry that has uh, uh, been sort of flopping around trying to figure out what it wants to be. And I think the solution for broadcasting, and you know what? We should have a guest on that owns um, a small group of radio stations. I can think of somebody right now off the top of my head. I'd love to have him on and say, how do you compete as a small broadcast uh, owner uh, in this world of giant uh, multi-billion dollar companies that are uh, running radio stations? I think the answer is going to be hyper local, which means uh, you're programming to the people in your particular area right, right. that uh, have very specific, relatable uh, issues that are brought up on the program. And you're not going to get that from syndicated or homogenized or programmed uh, radio programming from Mount Olympus, where they're where they're calling the shots. I think it's going to swing the other way as they pull out of this steep dive yeah. that they're in. And it's going to, it's, they're either going to go uh, to the point where they have to offload a bunch of radio stations. Like you just said, uh, that organization in Canada, that's uh, Bell Media. divesting is not unusual. There are a lot of stations here in the U S that are doing, they're, they're turning their licenses in even in uh, various markets. Wow. And uh, what's going to happen is that the small mom paws are going to start buying up these stations or, you know, grabbing them for little or no money. And then they're going to start programming them hyper local, and they're slowly but surely going to make some relevance to the broadcasting industry. Sort of how it started out way back when, because there was a time when broadcasting was all uh, network related. It was mutual broadcasting, NBC, uh, which was RCA, uh, CBS. I think ABC was just coming online. So it's a it's a very interesting kerfuffle. Uh, for the broadcasting industry to figure out what they got to do to, uh, I like that word, uh, what they got to do to uh, to make, to make a move. And we will have guests on this show that will be very specifically geared towards answering those those questions and pointing them out. I'm not an expert on sales. I'm a, uh, a, a somewhat frustrated, maybe some would say angry, uh, talent 
that used to be on the air. And I knew what, what got me traction back in the 70s and 80s and even 90s when I was on the air. When I was on the air uh, in the uh, East Coast uh, region of Philadelphia, um, and I talked about cheesesteaks, how local can you get? People came out of the woodwork. They all had a, a cheesesteak mm-hmm. place that they liked a whole lot. And somebody said, I think it's a National Cheesesteak Day. Was that you, Alex? No, I don't somebody think so. Somebody said that to me today. It's National Cheesesteak Day. I like a good cheesesteak. Who, who comes up with these things? I don't know. Somebody Does, does. that mean you got to run out and buy a cheesesteak? Anyhow, cheesesteak here, you know, not to talk about something that will get people galvanized, is uh, it's a properly prepared uh, a conglomeration of cheese and meat pro- product that are chopped and st- instead of slices of you know, when you go the farther west you go when they offer a philadelphia cheesesteak you get slices of steak with cheese on it and onions and that's not a cheesesteak folks right and it's also the bread that makes it you know very good well, but anyhow it's a hyper local subject that, that got people's attention and it's not going to work everywhere okay so hyper local as far as the future is concerned you're saying okay well we'll have we have to go more hyper local for uh, for terrestrial radio, but is that really sustainable? I mean, can these radio stations? I guess it's. I mean, it's okay in a way if a radio station is not making massive, massive money, and many of them don't. But um, I guess my question is: Is it really sustainable to be that niche? Can they still make these? Can they make a living? Really? Yeah, they can. I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. Because like like many things in life, there are misconceptions that everybody has been taught or believed to be true, and people believe right now that radio is dead or dying or it's on its last legs, and and it's because of the internet and Spotify and Pandora and Sirius XM. Great program, by the way. I'm saying that because. I really want to work with them. But anyhow, besides that point, uh, the, uh, uh, the the problem is, is that people are forgetting that there are other things that a, uh, a, a hyper local station can do that a big conglomerate cannot do. And that is relate to the listener in a very personal way. Um, you can't you can't do that and spread that peanut butter over a sandwich the size of North America. Great illusion, isn't it? Uh, You have to be very specific to the market you're in. And that means that uh, you're going to program to the tastes of those people in that particular area. You're going to talk about things that relate to them very personally on a very local level that wouldn't mean beans to somebody out in Lick Skillet, Alabama, uh, that it would mean something maybe in Wilmington, Delaware or Philadelphia. Uh, That's what I mean by hyper-local. And uh, those relatables are one of the key ingredients of what radio was always founded on is hyper-local content uh, that, uh, that people could relate to. Um, here's one of the weird uh, uh, fallacies of broadcasting is that people want Spotify or Pandora or uh, their own playlist on iTunes or whatever else is being used out there to uh, distribute music because they like the idea of having a choice of their own music. You know, I have a I have a, a library of like ten thousand songs behind me that plays throughout the day, and guess what? That's too big of a of a uh, playlist. And if somebody has a uh, iPad or iPod full of music that they listen to, or a, a Spotify channel full of music that they can listen to, and they have God knows they have every possible uh, genre of music uh, that lives there. What here's what happens is that radio people have always excelled at deciding that let's boil it all down to the cream and let the cream rise to the top. And that's what people really want to hear, not necessarily over and over again uh, until it drives them nuts, but you really want to hear the most familiar music most often. And the less familiar, once in a while, it's okay to bring it, let it boil up to the top and then drop down and be an, oh, wow, that I haven't heard that song in a a million years. And um, here's, here's the reality of that, you know, wanting that choice. I want the choice. But the reality is I want somebody else to curate that playlist. And I think the future of broadcasting might be that people are going to subscribe to tastes in music. So so so-and-so, Bobcat Garthwaite has a a playlist. Let's listen to Bobcat's playlist. I want to hear what he likes. That would be kind of cool. 
or Steve Martin or gosh, gosh well, who you know, knows? You know. Yeah, you know Apple actually has tried to uh, – I haven't heard much about this lately, so I don't actually know if they're still doing this. But uh, if you're an Apple Music uh, streaming subscriber, they have Apple – what they call Apple Radio. And they, they've hired a lot of celebrities, musicians, artists – I'll group them all together to curate playlists. And so they are doing that. It's not terrestrial broadcast, but it is it's done like a like radio, basically, but it's streamed on Apple Music. So I guess there is some what I'm saying is there is something to what you're saying, Mitch, about about having somebody else curate the the music. Cause I mean, my own music, my tastes are personal, and I don't necessarily like people dictating what I what I'm going to listen to, but also I probably am not exposed to as much music as I probably would like because I'm controlling all of that. So I think there's something to having somebody else curate and just expose you and open your mind to maybe new possibilities that you didn't really think about, right? Yeah, and and what happens? Hold on, I got to put mine up there too, so I can so I can have the goodness of my lower third there. Hi, I'm Mitchell Hill. Um, the other thing is that when you listen to a uh, your own collection of music, it could get boring. I mean, I expected all those songs. Those were my favorite songs. So why wouldn't I you know, get tired of hearing them over and over again? On the other hand, when you're listening to somebody else's playlist, whether it's somebody else's mix CD or whatever they might ha- happen to have, every once in a while, that's, you know, something comes on and really surprises you. Like You're like, uh, I like that. What is that? Who is that? And uh, my dentist the other day, not my dentist, my uh, skin doctor, that's why I have these railroad tracks on my face. Um, he likes his own music, and uh, he was saying, hey, have you heard uh, uh, you know, this group or that group? And he runs into his back office and starts playing something, and it comes in over the speakers. And I get exposed to stuff that I wouldn't normally do if I was curating my own list because I didn't know to play it. Yeah. Um, so when you have other people doing that, that's, that's the surprise. And that kind of gets back to what radio used to be is that when they played a top 40 playlist, yeah, it was the most 40 popular songs uh, in the country, but um, the diversity of the music that we used to play, when I was on uh, WFIL in Philadelphia in a major market, and I was a music director, we would play uh, Helen Reddy and I Am Woman, and the next song might be uh, uh, Stairway to Heaven by you know Led Zeppelin. What a train wreck that would be today if you played those two back to back, or yeah. Engelbert Humperdinck, and backed up by David Soul and "Don't Give Up on Me, Baby." Don't give up on me, baby. You know the uh, the the variety of music and the uh, the potential train wrecks mm-hmm. were very very wide. And granted, that's that was the the thing, but the extremes in styles and genres um, was what kind of made it interesting and surprising. Today, sure. it would be much more predictable, much more homogenized. And I, 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 again, I'm not a music programmer today. I used to be. Um, I would be very interested in hearing from professionals that do that now, saying, how do you, you, know, how do you break that down on one station as opposed to offering like, uh, like a Sirius XM or a mu- Apple Music? Uh, we're going we're gonna to curate 200 channels right. and nothing on. I think you, you ever, ever get that from people like... I get 200 channels and there's nothing on. Yeah. It just means that there's nothing on one of those channels that you got to that you like. That's so that's, um, what does that mean? I think that, that yeah actually that's a that's a great segue in that, into the next topic that I that I wanted to talk about that. But before we get to that actually that what you just said actually really piques my interest because I think we should actually have some program some music programmers that are still in that are in the industry right now so they can come on the show and talk to us about like well, what is it like now for a modern day music programmer? What are the challenges? Uh, that that you have, so I'm sure that's two guys it's not I would love job. to have on. I'd love to have uh, Lee Jacobs on from mm-hmm. New Voodoo. Um, he's a, a programmer, uh, futurist, we'll call him. So, Lee, don't ignore my emails. Uh, and uh, I also like you know who else I'd like to have on is Joel Denver, who used to run All Access Music, and it was one of the big uh, was the big uh, music programming service that uh, took over for Radio and Records way back when. And uh, was for the longest time like the resource that everybody that programmed music and uh, programming a radio station would go to. And Joel, Joel, come on the show. So we can get either of those people on. They would give us a perspective from 10,000 feet that uh, 
you and I are just speculating about, they would have the actual statistics to back up what they're saying. So very interesting subject. Uh, somebody's got to figure it all out before it the definitely plane won't goes be us, into the that's ground. For sure, it won't be. It won't. Well, be us you know, we might we might get lucky enough to to uh, to, to say, Mitch and Alex. They they nailed it. They nailed it. But nobody will know for sure until the plane is yeah. being the black box has been recovered yeah. and we find out what really happened. Exactly. So our next uh, the next article I wanted to talk about is the uh, not the death but the the severe um, let's just say reduction in uh, in programming for streaming platforms. Because one of the things that you mentioned, Mitch, was, you know, I have 200 channels and nothing's on, right? So we 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 find ourselves often with Netflix and all these different streaming platforms, thousands and thousands of movies and TV shows and all this stuff, and we're scrolling. Sometimes I find myself scrolling for, I look at my watch and I, and I say, holy shit, 30 minutes just passed and I haven't start I haven't found a single thing that I'm interested in, right? So there's that's that's a problem, but we've also seen the downturn in the film industry. They're not making they're really pulling pulling back on the amount of content that they're creating. They're realizing the that they have to sort of figure out the economics of these platforms. How do they actually make money? We've seen multiple uh, increases in subscription fees for for Netflix. Disney, Apple. Uh, I mean, yeah, my Apple subscription just went up 20, 20%. Uh, and Amazon even. And e- even if you pay for Amazon, I mean, look at what Amazon did a few months ago. You're paying for Amazon Prime, and they decided to put ads on it, even though you're paying for it. Now, if you really want to get rid of these ads now, you got to spend 2 or $3 extra on top of what you're already paying for. So we already have subscription fatigue. We're seeing people, so churn is another thing that all these companies are concerned about. So that is going to be an issue. And I wanted to talk to you about this, about the, uh, is this really the death of TV? Or have we seen, are we sort of passing the um, the era of, like, where we were so invested in these streaming platforms? Are people going to start buying Blu-rays again? Are they going to start buying more DVDs? Are they going back to physical? More vinyl. We're going back Me to discs, vinyl. man. We're going back to discs. I mean, I love physical media. I still prefer it. Uh, but I realize that I'm I'm in a minority, right? Most people do not have the space, the time, the willingness, the budget to be buying physical media. It, it, here's the problem. Here's the problem. And thank you for asking the question. I think it's a good one. Um, in my opinion, it's the methodology uh, that people use to select what they want for entertainment. And that means that everything um, is so, so complicated and so deep and everybody's vying for your attention that you only have so much attention that you can focus in any particular direction at any time. And if you want to be exposed to new music, you've got so many different choices that you've got a dumpster, a dumpster dive to find anything. Like how many people have their Netflix uh, subscription and they're constantly digging through hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, potential programs to see, well, I'm going to invest my time in that program. That looks interesting. And then you find out it's uh, subtitled or there's a lot. As soon as I see right. uh, guns and car chases, I'm out. I'm, I'm, I'm at, that's not a story. Uh, I, I go by story. So I'll go back to TCM and old black and white uh, film noir movies and things like that. And I have a friend by the name, his name's Tom Schustak, that knows everything about all the old movies and everything that was done right down to the lenses they were using to shoot them. I'd love to talk about that stuff because I think that was back Me to too. the golden age of films. Today, a film is a blockbuster if, um, it, if they spent half a billion dollars on CGI special effects. In other words, they can't make a movie now right. without spending multiple millions of dollars uh, in order to have the special effects. Like Dune apparently is smashing mm-hmm. box office records right now. That's an expensive proposition to put out there. But the story takes a back seat to the special effects. And I think that's a problem. And I think people are getting tired of that. So that may be affecting... People may just start getting overwhelmed by, um, you know who can be most hyper real as with special effects and wowing. You can't wow them so much anymore because you expect it. So the next uh, Marvel film that comes out, you're going to expect it. Wouldn't it be just neat to do a, a real story about the real personalities involved in being a superhero instead of superhero special effects to go along with it? Well, yeah. Why can we have one where there isn't some giant, you know, galactic mm-hmm. uh, uh, mystery force that's coming to destroy the planet? Who cares? 
let's uh, let's find out, you know, what's going on with uh, Wanda and and her friends. And uh, anyhow, the the point I'm making is that uh, everybody is vying for people with very very short attention spans, and that's kind of how what we've become as consumers of media. And if you don't have a plus after your name, like Paramount Plus or uh, whatever Netflix Plus or whatever pluses or uh, Max too or many, HBO, too many plus, too many pluses, too many. Yeah, the, the pluses to me is like a my right. little attendant and my antennas go up as soon as I see plus. I say, oh, that's going to be expensive, and they're going to add something that I don't really want. Yeah. Give me the meat and potatoes. I want more protein in my uh, my viewing choices. Yeah. I think the days of broadcast TV. Uh, the day, their days are numbered because oh, the sure. idea of watching a show and getting caught up in the action or the story and then it pauses and then you get uh, commercials for four or five minutes about things that right. you don't really want and they're trying to entertain or sell you something that you don't really need or they're trying to be entertaining to the point where you forget what it was they were they were trying to sell in the first place. Just watch it the Super Bowl commercials. The commercials come on. You see them. They may they may entertain you. You may laugh at them. But then you, but when you think about it, what was it that they were selling? You don't know because they were too busy trying to entertain you or get an award for uh, how creative they were. Well, so least, that's the problem we live. Everybody's trying to to throw a lot of flash and sizzle at you, and not doing the things that really make it work well. With radio, um, quality of music is not the same as it used to be. I'm not going to pick on. Uh, current styles and genres, but I'm saying the quality of that music is not the same as it used to be. There was a lot more work that went into it. Uh, it was more from the heart, shall we say. Um, and there are people will argue that to death with me. I just, you know, sure, bring it on. I'm ready for it. But uh, music has changed. That's why classic rock is so big now, because they're not making it anymore, not the way they used to. They're not doing things the same. People miss those days. They miss the days of the Beatles. And things like that. Um, and that be- that becomes complicated for a guy like right. me. It sort of makes me the last angry DJ because I'm pining for the days of old, and now I've become my father's well, son. Well, you could say that uh, uh, You could say that about a lot of things, but, you know, these streaming companies are wising up to the fact that, uh, that people are signing up for their service, binge watching all 10 episodes then immediately canceling it so and it's all and it's frustrating for me as a viewer now because i'm so used to just draw a, a series coming out and then being able to watch it all now they're pulling back on that and they're only releasing a new episode every week so you gotta come you gotta keep paying for it and i understand that these these platforms are expensive streaming bandwidth is expensive making the shows is expensive paying the people to do the effects and the actors and all this stuff it's all expensive i get it would you would you rather wait till they finish the series and then binge it or uh let them you know Mm -hmm. trickle it out to you one little bit at a time i i want to watch it all at once i don't like having to wait a week because sometimes i just forget so am i i i I forget i'm like i can't remember what happened last week there's too much too much content i can't remember what what's happened so um it's uh it's going to be it's going to continue to be a problem Uh, i don't know how much they can uh, us as viewers people paying for these services I don't know how much we can stomach. We continue to obviously pay for these services, but after four or five price hikes, you know, at some point people are just going to say, "Well, I don't really need this service anymore," right? So I don't. Well, if know. you if you stop for a moment and figured out how much you're spending, yeah, you know, money's tight for me anyhow because of what's happened with the the pandemic and post pandemic. Um, and uh, we're not getting rich off of this podcast, by the way. In case anybody was thinking we're making tons of money on it. Uh, we're doing it because we love the uh, the subject matter and what we're doing. We have something to say. Hopefully, people have want to hear what we have to say. If they don't, we won't do it anymore. But anyhow, the point I'm trying to make is that we're reaching that crisis point that you're that you're pointing out that says I have limited money and all these new streaming services. All of a sudden, I got to look at my uh, my bill at the end of the month, and I'm fifteen dollars here and twenty dollars here and thirty dollars there. I've got to decide. Some of these got to go. You know, is it going to be Disney this time that's going to go? Is it going to be Max? Is it going to be Netflix or Amazon Prime? Um, one of the things that Amazon's been doing that's ticking me off is they're starting to offer commercials and not commercials at a different price point. 
And um, I don't like the idea of commercials. I've, I've done, and even though I'm in the business of making commercials, but I don't, I don't like that. It's a, it's, it's an interruption. So that's um, why, you know, you're I, right. I don't have this. We have to decide all these things that are vying for our attention mm -hmm. um, are now uh, forcing us to make decisions on what we can and can't do or what we're not going to invest time in. Yeah. And um, I don't have this problem uh, with physical media because for stuff that I care about, I, uh, I have an incredible TV series and movie collection that I can go back to. Uh, what I want. I'm losing my voice here. I'll let you. Oh, there he goes, folks. He's hurling on camera. First hurl of the uh, YouTube season. But uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a tough one. And um, it's kind of like you got to reach through the camera and grab people by the throat and shake them and say, wake up, people. Um, it's OK to have just one streaming service. And you're gonna you're gonna stand by it, whether it's Max or Prime or Netflix, but you don't have to have them all. I have them all, and I gotta start I gotta start smartening up and getting rid of rid of some of them. And uh, usually, what happens is that I'll be just getting ready to cancel uh, Disney, and all of a sudden there's a new Star Trek that I want to see, um, and I and I hold on to it just for that reason. They have a it's 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 sort of like an addiction. In a sense, they start, you know, offering you new uh, drugs just in time to save the uh, uh, the subscription. So radio, so a little bit different, but similar, similar afflictions. There's uh, there's a lot of very specialized uh, radio forms. We used to kid about and Steve mentions it on the chat. Uh, we used to kid about punk country. It was a thing as a gag. Uh, but I, I wouldn't put it past uh, somebody doing actual punk country. Look, if Beyonce can do the number one song on the country charts right now, then there's room for punk country. So uh, it, it, we're all suffering from uh, a, an overkill of too many choices, too much time to invest, and too little free time uh, to decide what it is that we want to watch and uh, become involved in. And if you want to break that down much further— then, you know, Alex and I can speculate on it, but I think the world is too full of too many speculators on TV, newscasts, and things like that. I'd much rather bring in uh, people that are smarter than us, that know what they're talking about and can point to something. So let let that be a, uh, a needed addition to our list of guests to come on the show. Uh, one of the reasons we didn't do a guest this week is I thought we needed to refocus uh, what people really want to hear and, and based on uh, what we're getting on chat and uh, right. other sources, uh, we're we're hearing a lot of uh, interesting feedback about uh, what we're saying. Uh, yeah, I do speak from. Uh, thank you, Steve. I do speak as a boomer. I'm here to represent the boomer interests, and uh, that's part of what makes me the last angry DJ. And uh, the beauty of our uh, dialogue here is that is not what Alex is all about. And Alex is here to represent <laughs> his point of view and help me understand. Because you know that's the problem I, nowadays. What's the, that, what's the opposite of a boomer? Or a millennial? I guess. Without a doubt, a millennial is. I mean, I I feel that, and and here's the other problem. Um, it's very hard to get into a conversation with anybody without being polarized, either politically or uh, philosophically, over some issue that stops the conversation, and there's no crossing that boundary. That's not how we're meant to converse and communicate. It's like I had a telemarketer call the other day uh, that was calling on behalf of the uh, uh, one political group. I'm not going to say which. And, and they were saying all kinds of great things about what they're doing and how evil and ob obnoxious uh, the current administration is. And I said, can't we just talk about nice stuff that both parties have done? We don't have that middle ground for conversation. That's a problem. So that's part of what's, what's, what's also messing up our consumption of, uh, of media, whether it's radio or talk shows, or TV stations, is in order to compete in the world of uh, broadcasting now, you sort of have to, you know, claim your uh, turf and uh, pick your uh, political affiliation in order to get, you know, it's to very get frustrating. people to follow you. It's very frustrating because, you know, the ancient Greeks used to be really good about philosophizing and gathering all together in the town square and having these, you know, very differing opinions and being able to just engage in respectful adult conversations and seeing all sides seeing different perspectives and i don't know how we're going to get that back i don't know i'm not confident that we can get that back 
I don't know what the answer is. Uh, you know, um, some people have said over the years that Twitter is uh, sort of a modern digital equivalent equivalent of meeting in, in the town square. I'm not so, so sure about that because the thing is with technology and tools like the social media platforms is that we can curate. Right. I can build lists. You can build a list with only the people that you want to follow. So you are further reinforcing what your own beliefs are and you can just block out all this other noise that you're not interested. in. That's all fine and good, but that's also not necessarily the healthiest thing. That's my personal opinion. How do you feel? Yeah, about and that? the platforms are being politicized. Like right now, TikTok is undergoing a lot of uh, speculation. The government's getting involved. Oh, my God. Let's please keep the government out of it. But now they're saying that uh, it must be this, it must be that. I, you know, great. I understand that there are negative things that happen uh, through all these social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or TikTok. Uh, but why does it have to all be politicized and uh, put into a box somewhere? Why can't it just be like, for example, with with people? Why can't it just be Americans? You know, even if you're in Canada, we're all Americans here on this continent. Uh, let's not break it down into ethnic subgroups and. Uh, I, you know, I, what's in it for me? We just need to be a little more homogenized. And I think that would right. make things easier. And that's part of what's killing the media is that things are being mixed up and stuck in a box somewhere. And unless it appeals to you in this very specific way, you're not going to give it, uh, you know, the time of day. And that's that's very unboomer like uh, for me. I think it's much more I think the millennials are much more open to that. Younger people are much mm-hmm. more open to that kind of well, thinking. I think my generation's interesting because we, uh, you know, when, when I grew up, like I was born in 1982, so I saw what, Ouch. It, well, I saw what it was like before the internet, before cell phones, and so I would consider myself very technologically advanced in terms of like adoption and understanding how technology works, and I have to constantly keep up with what's going on now with the world of AI and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I saw what it was like, but there's there's a whole new generation that is growing up now that only knows a, an iPad. They only know an iPhone. Uh, they only know broadband internet. They didn't, uh, they didn't grow up where they just sometimes had to be bored. Like, do you remember what it was like to just be bored? And you had to find something to do, whether it was going to a friend's house or going out to the park or yeah, sure we had video games and tv but when i can and you know when i grew up there was a lot of well tv and video video games especially in the 80s video games are destroying our youth and i've yet to see that be proven but cell phones i believe it though i believe i believe cell phones are doing something very damaging and there's more and more data all the time from scientists and if you think that are cell phones, this, what does it actually do if, to your attention span? It's it's damaging. And if it. you think cell phones are damaging, wait, wait, till AI gets a hold of. It. I mean, AI could go God, to the dark side. And as me. many as much as we make fun of uh, Terminator and Skynet taking over, AI could go that way. The minute AI starts programming itself, starts to replicating its own programming, and we lose control of that, um, we're doomed. We're right. doomed as a race and as a, as a people. Um, and then we'll finally have something we all agree about. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the political pundits from both sides will agree. That's an, that's an evil thing that we, we have to gather together and destroy it before the uh, alien uh, species from <laughs> planet Zircon comes and takes us all away. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be something like AI is going to come in. And it just slowly but surely, before we know it, it's like, it's going to oh, be I can't do anything without AI. You, you can't it slow requires it down. that I use it. You can't slow it down. We're going to continue you can't to can't put see it back that. in a box. No. No, we can, we're seeing everything accelerate at an exponential rate. It's not going to slow down. Uh, I, as a somewhat of an aside, I'm very greatly concerned in the chat here that Steve Stryker says he has socks older than 1982. Either those socks have di- nearly disintegrated or those socks were so well manufactured that they've managed to stand the test of time 40 plus years that's incredible see that's old world fabrication they don't make stuff like that anymore we could have another hour conversation oh they just back in my, back in the day they made things to last you know well we're gonna have to bring steve back on because he was a excellent uh, guest uh he's a lousy chatter but he's an excellent guest so go figure i don't know how that works uh how can you be a great uh, a great guest and then be a really annoying chatter 
Um, he's picking on my booming, my boomer. I think he's entertaining. I, um, I'm enjoying this. Okay. I'm on the sidelines. As long as, I'm enjoying as long as he doesn't take over completely, you know, Steve's a good friend of mine, so I, I can say all this. Steve, while you're uh, writing all these uh, chat responses, uh, try to get some of our, uh, some of our guests who I've mentioned uh, to come on the show. But you have you have juice, as we like to say in a day. Get them get them in here because we we would love to have their opinions uh, dropped on us. Okay, so we've covered a lot a lot of space. You have anything else on your uh, list of news things that we need to talk about? Do you want all fifty things that have been uh, uh, that have been uh, annoying me over the last? Uh... No, I want uh, a curated list. So what's number three? <laughs> what's number three? I think for me, uh, the there, there's a handful of things that continue to irritate me. Uh, I just feel like language. It's it's funny, you know, when you're young, you 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 incorporate all this slang, and then when you get older, you hear younger kids introduce new slang, and then it irritates you that you don't understand what they're saying. But I really do feel like there are certain people now that I have no idea what they're saying half the time. There's just certain all the slang that's coming up in our language now. I have no idea what people are saying. I give feel, me give me an example. Give me an example of oh, a new I, slang okay. turn of phrase. Do you know what Riz means? Riz. I know Rizza is the actor. Used to <laughs> be with. Like, uh, there's all, oh, sus. That's another word. Like I, I just heard I my, heard that. Nine, sus my nine, year, nine-year-old nephews say the word sus, and I'm just trying to. For me, English speaking properly is important. I'm trying to instill that in my nephews. It's like, no, don't use that. Don't use that. But there, there are turns of phrase that I learned growing up culturally. Like somebody said it the other day, they said, well, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Well, I, I kind of like cats, and skinning a cat, I just can't imagine why we do that. And the people get like, oh, you can't, you, that's a bad turn of phrase. That's just a weird and if you have a cat, though. you would never skin a cat, no. not today. So why is that no longer an appropriate thing? Because it's too visual or it's too insulting. Uh, but some, at some point, it was apparent, apparently that's what they did. You know, you know, when people push back on me, when people say, when I complain about all this slang, and then I have, sometimes people will tell me, well, Alex, you know, the language, the English language evolves over time. Yeah, it's evolving for the worse. It's getting worse. I can actively see this. I know people that are in their 20s, and the language is worse. They do not sound intelligent. <laughs> it's just, it's just it's, well, you know, there's a, there's a great divide, because when I start using a turn of phrase that we used to use that we don't hear so much anymore— uh, the younger folks would say, what, what does that mean? You know, like, I, I mean, I'd have to write them down because I can't, you know, you know what? I don't understand uh, cl- COVID. I can't, uh, my, my recall is not as good as it was. So I, I don't I'll blame it on COVID. I don't understand how somebody can say bro repeatedly, you know, 50 times over the course of a conversation, bro, bro, this, bro, that bro, bro. They don't, they Do don't say bro, bro. They say bra, like, dude, they seriously. say bra. Come on, bro. Every every they don't once say in a while, it like bro. I'll say dude. I'll throw in a dude. The occasional I'll pepper. Dude. I'll pepper a little bit of slang in my everyday conversations. You know, just just a subtle, just a little bit. But there are people. Well, you know, it's like the watching the president do a uh, uh, a, a meet and greet, and he refers, "Hey, man, what's up, man?" And I'm like, I don't know if that's presidential. Can you say that? Can you say man as a pre- – it's just an older person using a turn of phrase that they used every day in their time that just doesn't fit. You know, like uh, – uh, oh, what was the – that is – Yeah. Uh, do, do I'm you just think, I'm, Again, I'm do, trying to remember a phrase that just doesn't sound right coming out of my mouth. Do you think mouth, that but, it's it's when, you know, as you get older, you, you actually uh, – there's a part of your, your brain that starts to actually – Tell like there's a the little person in your brain that says you don't fit, you don't fit in anymore. Everything's annoying. You don't like anybody. You don't like the way people talk. You don't like the the, the music the, the music that's out there. And you start to become more and more of a, of a curmudgeon as you get older. That's what I'm finding. Just more, I'm more. I have less of a tolerance for people. I just the moment well, I it, can tell within ten is, seconds. I can tell within ten seconds if I'm Alex, going to like you. Alex, it's hardwired into us to be tribal by very nature, and everybody has to be the same. They have to speak the same, and they have to be in your particular, you know, uh, a, a box, so to speak. And people that speak outside that box and use different language, languages and different words uh, begins to become them and not us. And that's what people just naturally are hardwired to dislike that. 
and uh, even some words that some groups will be able to use, it's okay. But if I were to use that same word, not okay, very inappropriate word to use. And you can imagine what I'm referring to. I'm not going to say it. Sure. Because some of those words makes me very uncomfortable when I hear them being said by anybody. I don't care who you are. It makes me uncomfortable, whether it's an ethnic slur or something that's been uh, somehow uh, adopted by some group of people and they're using it. So language is very, very powerful and also very damaging. In the world we live in today, uh, words can hurt. They truly can hurt. They shouldn't, but they hurt. People have no tolerance for them, and that's part of the the divide. We'll call it the Great Divide. It's also another yeah. thing that makes me angry um, is the fact that language is so easily uh, misconstrued. Like my favorite bit that I tell you about is using the word uh, lazy Susan at Thanksgiving, and people went, oh, can't lazy, lazy Susan. What about – how does lose Susan feel about that? I'm like, that's not what I meant. You know, there's there's an attachment to every word you use, and some of those attachments may even be cultural, and um, unless you fit that, uh, you know, that particular group. So I don't know. We're 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 running the gamut here of uh, conversation, but a lot of these all relate to how do we communicate with each other, and that's something that radio is not doing a great job. It's not doing a great job of communicating uh, with uh, their constituency the way they used to. They're trying to be the tastemaker. And that might have a lot to do with all kinds of things. And uh, I'm fascinated by um, how music mm-hmm. as, a, uh, uh, as a medium has changed uh, very drastically because of the way it gets uh, produced and recorded uh, by the people that write it, uh, the different genres that are, that are you know, it, it, as far as the people that, that consume that media, more power to them. That's, that's why we have a free country where you can enjoy certain types of music that you want to, but uh, it doesn't mean you have to push it down my throat if if I don't like it or I'm not comfortable with it. And viva la difference when you can. Um, I, one of my favorite stories, I was on a uh, flight somewhere and uh, a young lady sat next to me, I'd say young, probably early teens, and um, she pulled out Pink Floyd and Dark Side of the Moon on a CD and put it in her CD player. Um, and I was absolutely smashed. I was gobsmacked, as they like to say. So I kind of leaned over and said, Pink Floyd. And she says, oh, man, they are so rad, or whatever she said. See, rad. I go, rad. You that's at my a, age, you can't say. I'm not allowed to say rad anymore. I, I wanna, but anyhow, I, I feel like she that's, was so that's a word that's complimentary of Pink Floyd, and that was like barely part of my growing up culturally. And I was so impressed that here was a young person that represent that saw it and related to it and thought it was very very cool or uh current songs where they take a sample from uh a, a popular song that I grew up with and now it's part of their particular uh, you know yeah big willie does it will smith well i think there's some albums. i i think what you're saying is sort of the to sort of um encapsulate what what you're saying there i think that uh it's obvious that language evolves i mean you know i i i've been sitting here complaining about all the things that piss me off about modern day language but you're right it does evolve and the in all seriousness too i this is something i've learned over the years is that words do matter like you said mitch it is important and it does at least make me more aware of my own language and how i may be perceived when i talk to people so that's definitely something that i think about and i think that's healthy i think that's important i think we should all do that we should all think about well, when I say this to this person, how are they going to, this is about being empathetic too, right? How do I, how is that person really going to perceive what I'm saying and how are they going to feel about that? So I think that's that's a decent human being thing to do. And I think we could probably all learn to do that a little bit, a little bit better. By the way, we just had uh, John Preto actually just came in uh, to the live stream. So hello, Mr. Hey, Preto. John, Good how are you? you? Hope you're feeling well, buddy. John is a great guy. And, you know, let me let me ask you. I mean, it, it's so obvious for somebody of my generation uh, to look at uh, Alex Alexander, who's here, and say, uh, what's up with that hair? You know, that's that's so different. Um, or, you know, he's he's not shaved. I'm clean shaven. I'm balding. So what? I can do it. But it's it's an easy and and cheap uh, commentary for me to pick on you because of your appearance. It's much better to try to understand that 
you're making you're 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 your own person and you choose to have a certain look and style maybe you have something behind it you're trying to make a point about but the fact no, is there, there's no point it <laughs> there's no well, point. That's interesting I just, but I have a re relatively thick skin, so I, I don't mind when people, I don't really care all that much, but I do get comments all the time on the internet because, you know, people have opinions about things and they can't help themselves. And but you're, lo you're low hanging fruit for uh, people that are going to grasp for the easiest. Well, comeback. sometimes I, I, something about the look, you nah, know, the know. piercing, the bit, tattoo, it's a bit edgy. I, I you know, the clothing. It. Yeah. Sometimes and, I'll um, get people that'll Luckily, drive by you don't take something. it personally. And you know what? I, I like the idea that I have somebody here. That I can, I can, that can help me understand because I want to understand. If I, if I hear you listening to something unusual uh, musically, I want to understand. Well, what, what are you hearing that? Uh, that that gangster rap doesn't do anything for me. Um, explain that to me, and you can, and you, and you would take the time to explain it to me. Not that that's your favorite, but I'm just saying. Yeah. Somebody that uh, that doesn't instantly get kerfuffled and say, "Well, you 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 just don't. You're just too old to understand." What it's like? Why don't you grow a mohawk and uh, get a few piercings? You know, and if I did there's, get a there, if I did get a tattoo, there's an image for you. If I get it, got a tattoo before I go into a nursing home, I'm going to uh, have a tattoo in a certain place on my body that says "Some objects are bigger than they appear." That would be what I would put on. <laughs> Paul uh, Walhus uh, just joined us, and he was actually just saying that uh, KUHS and Hot Springs might might be uh, the type of radio station that would carry our show. Maybe we could be in syndication, like the like the big time. Do they really? But see, the minute we do that, there's some political baggage that comes with it. You know, once once we become part of the, uh, uh, the you know the aristocracy of broadcasting, uh, are they going to be controlling us and how we present? If somebody said they wanted to carry us, can't swear. Um, I probably would say no problemo, but don't tell me what to say or what I can't say, and that will break right. some of the rules because you know apparently uh, the FCC are taste masters and. Uh, you're not allowed to say certain words, according to George Carlin, on broadcasting. But by the way, let me let me bust that myth, myth since we're on it right now. Uh, the FCC doesn't give you a list, which would be hilarious if they did, of words you can't say on the radio. Always has been this way. They say in their own little special way, they say, well, it's up to you as a local broadcaster that, you know, has a responsibility to your uh, 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 your constituency to decide what is considered to be obscene or uh, uh, inappropriate language. Okay, it's not it's not a specific word. You can't you can't drop an f bomb on the air uh, because that would be an instant uh, lightning rod for somebody. But the FCC doesn't come right out and say you can't say that. Interesting. They say it's up to you to decide whether or not that's appropriate. And if somebody writes in and complains about it, now you got to explain yourself. So that's kind of how that works. It's very lawyer-esque, in my mm. opinion, on how that happens. And if we were to be syndicated, all right, what are, what are the you know what are the, the what are the attachments? What are they going to say? We can't, it can't do. We can't have a frank discussion like we're having right now. We're having a very deep discussion, by the way. Absolutely. That probably cuts across all kinds of political and uh, financial uh, uh, corners and may raise a few eyebrows on by station yeah. owners one I way just, or the other, but. I just want to say, like, I'm first of all, I'm I'm honored that Paul even thinks that this show is uh, even up to the the quality level of the, that he thinks that a radio station. Will. So I'm I'm super super honored that he thinks that. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, Mitch, this just popped in my brain. Apropos of nothing, do you think it's valuable to announce the weather on a radio station in 2024? We have all this data. We have the internet. We have instant access to information. Who the hell cares about the current temperature, the current forecast? I have this data on my phone 24-7. Why does anybody need a human being to announce it? Why do they still do that? Uh, I'll tell you exactly why they do it. Please. Um, and I've said it before. I'll say it again. The, the, the main job of a live, if it's live, if it in, indeed is live, maybe live assist, there's still a computer involved somewhere. But anyhow, if it's live and people are listening to you, uh, because if something should happen in their world, they want to know about it right away without having to flag it down on the Internet. Um, they want to know if there's a big storm or a flood happening or if the interstate is closing and that's the exit they normally take. They really want to know, is everything OK? That was the one thing over and over and over again that was drilled into me as a broadcaster 
even back into the 70s when I was on the air, is make sure people know that they're okay. It's a beautiful day. Things are going your way. Smile, put a smile on your face. Here's a great song to take you away. And say, Because sometimes you go away because you want to get away from all the hyper-sophisticated uh, 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 local weather or disasters or things that are happening in the world. Um, I've had friends tell me uh, when I would complain about, you know, this or that or something I saw on the news. Um, I have a very good friend of mine who I respect. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, he said, stop watching the news, Mitch. I think it would be a very, very good thing for you to start, stop watching the news, whether it's CNN or Fox or one of the other ones. Stop watching it. Mm-hmm. If it if it's affecting you that much, you need to get away from it. Stop consuming and, the and, things that hurt you. And and where where exactly are uh, where are you at right now with all of this in terms of your mental health, your your t- attention span, where where you're you're diverting all your attention to all these different things that are going on? It's kind of overwhelming sometimes. I, I, I'm kind of a laser focus. Uh, I only get mm-hmm. upset about one thing at a time. I don't get upset with a lot of different things. Um, I won't go into any detail, but, uh, I will a little bit. Um, I lost my dog this week. Um, I had to put him down after 16 years. He had a great life. Um, uh, but it really hammered through some things to me that I had never thought about before. First, you're extraordinarily sad. Anybody that's had to put their pet down that they love, uh, has to go through a grieving process and it's, it really affects you, uh, in a very personal way. And I'll try to keep from uh, losing. Hey, look, if John Stewart can talk about it on uh, the Daily Show, I can talk about my poor dog Paddywhack. Uh, but I had to, I had to put him down. But there's something that Paddywhack caught me that was uh, taught me that was fundamental, uh, and that was what a dog can teach you or an animal can teach you is how to live in the moment. Um, your pet or your animal is living for what's going on right now. They're not worried about what happened yesterday. They're not worried about what's going to come tomorrow. They're putting all their love and all their attention into what's going on right now, right in front of them. I know this sounds sort of prophetic, but it's a gee whiz moment for me that my dog taught me that. And when he went uh, and I was looking him in the eye, because I take that job very seriously, that if you have to put your dog down, that you should be the last face that they see and they should know that you love them and they love you. 100%. Um, it's uh It's just that moment of communication that you have. So if we could do more of that with each other and live more in the moment and not worry about those things, I think we'd be better for it as people. So I'm sorry to bring everybody down with that. No, I think think that's important. You can see it affects me. I I, I know you've had a tough week. I think that's an important message to leave everybody with today. Um, Yep. You know, I think we all need to be more gentle with each other and also ourselves. And, you know, especially us as creative people, a lot of us that – you know, I know a lot of our listeners and people watching right now on YouTube do uh, similar jobs working in production, and uh, we're, we're our own worst critic, and it's uh, it's really easy to beat yourself up. I find myself sort of, ca- I, I find myself catching myself all the time. Um, so I find myself uh, sort of stopping and going, wait a minute, what am I doing here? You know, if I make a little mistake, sometimes it's the most minute thing. It might be even something just on this show. Oh, why did I cut to that angle? Or I lingered too long on myself or lingered too long. And then you start you start going, ah, I could do better. And, you know, sometimes the average person doesn't really notice these tiny little mistakes. But we, we, we run this thing through our minds all the time. And we just need to be a little bit more gentle is all I'm saying. I think the mistakes we make here on this program are, first of all, they're made sincerely uh, we're not the smartest people. We're not the most popular podcast on the planet. But if we make a mistake, then that should be as much of a teaching moment uh, for ourselves and for people watching as it should be the people that are super smart, that are professional inter- uh, interviewers and have podcasts. Maybe, you know, 80 percent of what we just talked about uh, was kind of like, okay, this is mildly entertaining, and I kind of get what they're saying. I don't agree with most of what they're saying. But if just one thing that we talked about here, Alex and I talked about, caught you and and stuck with you, then your time here invested was well time well spent. And uh, to me, that is the reason we're going to do this podcast on a regular basis. As long as we have something that to contribute that wouldn't otherwise be here, not just to be a couple of talking heads uh, every Sunday and then 
uh, on a podcast. Um, I, it's not so super important that I express my opinion, uh, but as long as we get it out there and uh, we make some sense and we are bringing something that isn't otherwise necessarily uh, being presented, then we have something here. We have something to build on. So smash the button that says you like us. No, I'm sorry. I had to jump out of character for a second there. Make sure you uh, you like us and subscribe because uh, this is your program as much as it's ours. Tell us what you want us to do. Uh, if we're doing things that you like, tell us what you like. If you want to see more parody and entertainment, then maybe perhaps we can invest time uh, and effort into doing that. There are a lot of different things we can do instead of just having, uh, you know, deep conversations. Great conversation, by the way, uh, Alex. I appreciate Absolutely. your. I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, coming it. Coming up with the subjects. Yeah, it was another interesting conversation. And thank. I just want to thank everybody. Thank the viewers. Uh, thank all the early adopters who have been uh, with us for these uh, first three episodes here. And uh, just wanted to remind everybody as well, uh, you can always reach out to us. Uh, don't be shy. Send an email to hello at the last angry DJ. And we're available on all social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, or I should, or I should say X, uh, Instagram and TikTok at the last angry DJ as well. We've got sh- uh, social media uh, clips uh, popping up there now, uh, bite-sized content. So you can see what we're, what we're about as well. And uh, thanks again for everyone uh, for, for checking us out. We've got the audio version of the podcast available on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Amazon Alexa, all of those platforms as well. So if you don't really want to see our faces, you absolutely don't have to. <laughs> and you can uh, I'll let Mitch have the, the last word. But, uh, you know, audio is fine. It's fine. Well, thanks for letting me have the last word. I, I, I think the most brilliant thing that I did when um, I – thought about having this program was to immediately accept uh, Alexander's uh, request to join uh, because this program is as much of uh, Alexander's program as it is mine. I might've been the guy that's, you know, mentioned that it would be kind of cool to do, but um, we will do this as long as there's a need for what it is that we're doing. And I really like the fact that uh, Alexander can be a guy that can be on here that can discuss many different subjects uh, and if we don't agree, don't don't feel badly. We have mutual respect to each other's opinion that, yeah, you know, we, we agree to disagree kind of things sometimes if uh, if it goes that way, if we have a knockdown, drag out uh, battle over it. But uh, even as uh, some people that are chatting uh, with us, oh, we love that. We love that. And if you're one of the uh, first 28, we have 28 subscribers so far. Yeah, John Prado um, subscribed. And he actually says, I just want to actually make a correction here. He actually says... He does want to see you on camera, Mitch. He wants to see you do the river dance. Do you know how to do the river dance? You know what you that's about? You mean the thing where they kick their feet up and... I'm not sure what the... the is, the that, TikTok, is, that what, uh, is that what it is? What is it? The, the, the hub hap hub chub hub maybe, maybe whatever. John, maybe John can elucidate on the, the river dance. What is that, John? Anyways, it's one of the things where they move. stick your head on a bunch of people and they, and they dance around and do yeah. annoying things. He wants to see you move around. <laughs> he wants to see me move? I just I don't move, pal. I'm I'm 69 years old. This is it. <laughs> I might loom. I can loom really he well. Likes the chair. I can get in the microphone and talk with in a world. Uh, but I'm trying to keep my head smaller in the picture because I last week uh, my head was way too big. On I watched it that at camera home on my YouTube screen. Right? Uh, right I, I'm afraid my, I'm, I'm stuck. But yeah. uh, when you see your head in your living room and it's like looming this Scary. big. And you're like, oh, do and I need a haircut. I know that, and I got stitches on my face from where the, I've got sun damage. By the way, um, if you're younger, the stuff you do to your head with uh, the sun right now, you're gonna pay for it in 20 years. This is what happens. You get this stuff, where they gotta go in and take the uh, the cells out. Uh, the other thing is your hearing. Take care of your hearing. Uh, I destroyed my hearing from uh, many years of wearing a set of Cost Pro 4 AA uh, headphones. An extraordinary loud, I mean, like at 130 decibels while I was on the radio. We didn't know back then Jeez. you were going to destroy portions That's of insane. your hearing. So, so uh, I, the last word wise, thank you so very much. And as I said, if you're one of the 23 uh, subscribers, uh, just count yourself as lucky because someday when there are 100 subscribers, you're going to say, I was part of that 23 that started this whole thing out. So, uh, we'll be back again uh, next week with a with a uh, guest 
on our thing. And as I mentioned pre-show, um, I just booked um, uh, Craig Shoemaker on April 7th. That's two weeks away. Um, so that'll be really interesting to have a uh, comedian who deals with the cancel culture today because it's part of what we're talking about from from the trenches, so to speak. So thank you for joining us for uh, uh, Episode 3. I want to thank Alex for being here. Thank you. And Mitch. all the many people that are uh, watching right now. Thank you. God bless. And stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Slow fan.